Alison Klein is a reporter and anchor of the Spire Life blog for the Washington Post. This blog shares about people who beat the odds and otherwise inspire humanity. On November 13, 2017, in honor of the World Kindness Day, Alison Klein shared the post The Kindness of Strangers, Seven Tales of Totally Unexpected Benevolence from Our Readers. All seven stories are somehow moving, but I was touched by the story shared by 76-year-old Lucy Sotar from Arlington, Virginia. She wrote, About a week ago, I moved from our five-bedroom house into an apartment in an adult, adult living community. Somehow, I managed to pare down our family's belonging so they fit in my small bedroom plus then apartment. But box were main furnishing at the first. I badly mangled my knee last year and wearing a brace and using a walker made it very difficult to move things around. Next day, Blind sent out a salesperson to help me select a measure for blinds. She couldn't help but notice my problems unpacking. Before leaving, she said, I'm free Saturday. Why don't I come out and help? And she did. My blinds were installed on a Tuesday. And on Saturday, she returned. Like a cyclone, she got my living room looking like a real living room. She moved furniture, hanged pictures, and helped me find place for other furnishings. She even went to Target and bought me some hangers and other small items, and wouldn't let me reimburse her. It feels so good to know I can have people over now without being embarrassed. I have been the recipient of many acts of random kindness in my life. They challenge me to always be grateful and pass on the kindness. Benevolence is one of those words that we have all heard and maybe even used, but define it can be difficult. Most often someone would define it as just being nice. In reality, the definition is a little more than just being nice. It is being nice without expecting to get anything back. It is being nice by giving to others what they need, not just what is easy or convenient. It is easy to be nice to your best friend, but what about a total, a total stranger or someone who has not been kind to you? Benevolence is the manifestation of love for love is not complete without the giving of oneself. Let me ask you something. When was the last time that you received a random act of kindness? What was that? Or when was the last time that you made a random act of kindness? What was that? I want to give you two minutes to think about it and share your experience with those around you.
In this series, The Silver Scrolls, A Special Blessing for Your Day, we have been studying about two small silver scrolls that were found in Jerusalem in 1979. They recorded a priestly blessing from Numbers 6, 24 to 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God spoke this to Moses around 1500 BC and the scrolls were dated to the 7th century BC, which means the blessing was still being honored 800 years later. Why was this scripture so important and what did it mean? Since God told Aaron and the priests to say this blessing over future generations, it must have an important purpose. You see, blessing according to the Bible does not lie in heaven at all. Not in having abundant possessions or wonderful relationships or even being judged really useful. What is blessing then? The priestly benediction tells us it is very simple. Blessing lies in God, in His abiding presence, in having a face-to-face -face relationship with the Lord, experience His protection and favor. The blessing of number six is presented in the poetic Hebrew style, an elevated form of speech characterized by parallelism, terseness, and the use of metaphors. In Hebrew, the first line of the blessing, in verse 24, consists of three words, the second line of five words, and the third line of seven words. The progression in the number of words mirrors the outworld movement and flow of God's blessing through, through the single priest to the broader community. Each of the three lines in the blessing consists of two clauses. The first clause invokes God's movement toward the people. Bless, make the face to shine, lift up the face. And the second clause names the results of these three divine movements toward the people. Keep you, be gracious to you, give you peace. The Lord, Yahweh, is explicitly named a subject in the first clause of each of the three lines. That God is the source of blessings is accentuated again in the concluding statement in verse 27. God proclaims, I'll bless them. The I is emphatic in Hebrew. Although Aaron and his priestly sons speak the blessing, the blessing remains under God's control and God's discretion. We have briefly studied the first line of the blessing, verse 24. Now we are moving to the second line, verse 25. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The second part of the blessing begins in a vivid metaphor of the Lord's face shining upon His people. Just before we go deeply into what it means to have God's face shine upon us, I want to take a step back and ponder for some time about the action of God of making His face know, available to human beings. The second and the third line of the blessing talks about God's face. The Hebrew word panin, used in the verse 25 and verse 26, refers to the physical face. Note that God is speaking of Himself in human terms so that He can be understood by finite beings and that the Bible refers that humans cannot see God's face. But he, God said, You cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. 
However, the face may also refer idiomatically to someone's presence, because seeing a face required being in the person's physical presence. And here, in my humble opinion, lies the most important lesson. The greatest blessing of all is that God blesses us with His very presence. And we have studied this point in this series. However, God's desire goes far beyond a sporadic encounter with human beings. The Bible declares that God's wish is to be with us, to dwell with us, to have a relationship with us to be with his loved ones. God gave Moses the blessing that we're studying, but he also gave him instructions for a tabernacle for a very important reason. Exodus 25, 8. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. The main purpose of the sanctuary was to have a visible dwelling place for God right in the midst of the camp, and also in the center of all aspects of Israel's life. It is a place of meeting for God and humans, God with us. God provides a way to dwell with His people through the tabernacle, and His presence in the old sanctuary was known as Shekinah. The dwelling and God's presence came into another level when the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the own and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. When Jesus came into this world, He was truly, literally, God with us. Behold, the virgin shall be with a child, and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. God's longing for dwelling reaches out to the time when sin will be no more. The book of Revelation declares, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold the tabernacle of God. He is with men, and He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people. God Himself will be with them and be their God. So as the priestly blessing talks about God's face, it is referring in some way to His presence. And God's presence, presence is related to His desire of dwelling. When God is present, when He comes, God craves to stay, to stay for good. He desires to dwell. What does this desire of God for dwelling with us say to you? What does it mean to you? I want to give you two minutes to think about it and share your thoughts with those around you.
an immigrant to this wonderful country and having most of my relatives overseas, I think I can grasp the desire for dwelling. When my parents, my loved ones, come to visit our home here in Canada, we have the blessing of, of their presence. Usually they stay for a few weeks and then comes the time to say goodbye. And I tell you, I'm not fun of those moments. I wish they could stay longer. I wish they could stay for good. I wish they could dwell in Canada. Now, imagine God. He comes to us. He makes His presence known. He bless us and then He needs to leave. He needs to leave not because he wants to leave, because if it was for him, he would stay forever. He would, he would dwell with you and I. But we, yes, you and I, make him run. Because he is a gentleman and, and would never, never force himself on anyone. Most of the time, we take his luggage and we say to him, God, it is time to go. It is time to leave. And we do, we do that because we don't prioritize Him. We don't have time for Him. We don't love Him enough with all, with all our heart, with our soul, with our strength, and with all our mind. We haven't surrendered completely. But God wants to stay. And then He leaves. He longs to come back and to stay longer, if possible, for good. So, don't miss the point. God's presence is intimately related to His desire of dwelling. Let's go back to the second part of the blessing that talks about God's face in a very unique and specific way. The Lord make His face shine upon you. Did you know that the metaphor portraying God's face as light shining upon His people occurs in many biblical texts and extra biblical texts as well? But what does it mean? What do you think it means? I will give you two minutes to think about it and share your thoughts with those around you. As I said before, the metaphor portraying God's face as light shine upon His people occurs in many, many biblical and extra-biblical texts. In the ancient Near East, 
when a, a deity face shines, it is a sign of favor. The imagery of the shining of the divine face occurs in several Mesopotamian and Algorithmic contexts in which the gods bestow gifts and extend mercy to individuals or nations. As we study this expression in the Bible, we will learn many things. In Psalm 80, the phrase, Restore us, O God. Cause your face to shine, and we shall be saved. Functions as a refrain in a context of a plea for God to deliver his people from oppression. In Psalm 44, verse 3, the psalmist praised God for victory that was accomplished over the enemies of God's children. It was your right hand, your arm, and the light of your face for you loved them. The second line of the blessing, verse 25, employs the metaphor of light to refer to God's face as it shines with benevol benevolence upon the nations. The shining face could be understood as figure of speech for benevolence. Light connotes clarity, revelation, the warmth of sunshine, rescue from cold darkness, renew of life, and the brightness of joy. The bright shining of God's face upon Israel is a theme in an exuberant psalm of praise that celebrate, celebrates God's fertile blessing and deliverance in times of trouble. Psalm 67 begins with these words. May God be gracious to us and bless us, and make His face to shine upon us, that your way may be known upon earth, your saving power among all nations. The focus of the psalm on all the nations and all creation suggests that the image of God's shining face evokes the wider theology of God as a creator of all as the living giving rays of the warm sun extend over all the world, so the blessing of God's shining face radiates out of the ends of the earth. Psalm 67 concludes, The earth has wielded its increase. God, our God, has blessed us. May God continue to bless us. Let all the ends of the earth revere Him. As God shines His face upon His people, He is shining benevolence, divine benevolence. He is sharing kindness. He is distributing gifts. He is giving away blessings. He is handing out protection. He is offering salvation. He is a loving God. He is love. He is the benevolent God. Benevolence is based on altru altruism. It does not expect to get anything back. Benevolence gives to others what they need, not just what is easy or convenient. Benevolence does not happen as reward to someone's good behavior, but it is a reality despite behavior. The benevolent heart leans towards others. It's not neutral or indifferent. Benevolence is the manifestation of love for love, is not complete without giving of oneself. But the sad reality is that you and I can say no to benevolence. You and I may decide not to accept gestures, gifts of benevolence. You and I can say no to God's benevolence. Or we can even say no to the benevolent God. God is in the business of blessing. He is the only source of blessing. He is the God of blessing. As we are in His abiding presence, He provides what we need. He protects us. He keeps us safe. He is benevolent to us. At the end, 
He wants to do well with us forever. How should I, how should I say no to Him? It is time to say yes. It is time to listen to Him. How are you doing? And how is your life right now? Ask yourself and for once be honest and true. Take a deep look inside at all the feelings there. Something's not right. You cannot explain. So ask your heart where happiness truly lies. For that will indeed explode. to Jesus and be still to Him. 